And we now move on uh, to questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. Can I inform members, please, that questions 6, 8 and 10 have been withdrawn? I call Mr Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Minister. An action programme to implement the EU Nitrates Directive across the north of Ireland was first introduced in 2007. The Nitrates Action Programme regulations are joint legislation between my department and the Department of the Environment and contain a wide range of measures. These measures are to prevent water pollution and to ensure that manures and chemical fertilisers are used efficiently. The Nitrates Directive requires action programmes to be reviewed and, as necessary, revised every four years. A comprehensive review of the current action programme was completed by the departments and scientists from the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute in March this year. Subsequently, a public consultation on the proposed action programme for the next four years period from 2015 to 2018 has been carried out. The departments intend to make some revisions to the proposed measures to take into account the responses to the consultation. The departments are also in the process of seeking European Commission agreement for the next action programme. The proposals for the 2015-18 action programme should not require any significant changes to the current farming practices. The majority of measures in the current action programme are being carried forward. Key measure, measures, such as the dates of close period for, slurry, for spreading slurry, remain unchanged despite the pressure from the European Commission for a longer close period. The changes which are proposed are based on scientific evidence, technical and policy developments, or have been requested by the European Commission. My aim is to continue to have a balanced action programme which is practical for farmers, effective for protecting water quality and meets the obligations under the Nitrates Directive. Well, Mr McKinney for a supplementary. Mr Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister. And as a further step, is she prepared to issue clear guidelines to farmers on ways to reach the targets set by Europe? Obviously, um, as I said, as part of um, the review and the action plan, both my department and the Department of the Environment worked very hard in terms of consulting with the industry to make sure that they are up to speed with what it is that we are doing. But absolutely, any requirements that are on the farming industry, but as I said, by and large, um, the reality is that there, there will not be very much difference in terms of farming practice. However, if there are any changes that impact on farmers, we will of course be issuing guidance and making sure that everybody is able to comply and given all the necessary information that is required. Call Mr Phil Flanagan for supplement. The Minister will be aware that we have had uh, changeable weather in, in September, so I am interested to, to learn what impact these proposed changes will have on the proposed closing date for, for spreading slurry. And I did not really know there was that much interest in spreading slurry in South Belfast as a secondary comment. I will not comment on the second part, but I, I certainly pick up on the, the spreading of slurry. Um, as I said in the original answer, the um, by and large, the farming practices will remain um, as they are. However, one of the issues that was raised was around the closed period for spreading slurry. And th the length of that closed period has been an issue for the European Commission for quite some time, and not just in this um, review of our action plan, but also in previous um, negotiations on, on the action programme. But officials have successfully, um, I suppose, negotiated on that issue that there will be no changes to the, to the current dates that the Commission did not get their way in terms of trying to extend that. So that is a positive outcome because I know um, even some farmers would find it frustrating the period that we actually even have at this moment in time. So um, farmers will continue to demonstrate good practice when they are spreading their slurry and they will take um, great care to protect water quality. And as you said rightly, the, the recent dry, well, dry um, spell of weather has mean that, means that conditions are very good for slurry spread and will allow farmers then the opportunity to maximise its um, fertiliser value and have slurry tanks emptied before the um, winter housing period. Well, Mr Robin Swan for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister mentioned good practice. Will she also include an update on safety practice as well? Because since the night race directive was introduced on the 1st of January 2011, we have had seven deaths related to slurry due to asphyxiation or drowning. Whereas previous to that date, on the 1st of January 2011, there was only two deaths related to slurry, and that was back in 2005. I, mean, I absolutely um, agree with the member in terms of concern around the number of deaths that we had with, um, as a result of slurry. The Health and Safety Executive through the Farm Safety Partnership, as you know, um, has been doing excellent work in trying to raise awareness around Think Safe um, and promoting that message. And they have quite a number of other areas of work which they are continuing to um, bring forward, particularly around Farm sa Safe Nets, so actually going online and going through qu a quite a quick course, but I think that we all have an obligation, both in my department, Daddy department and other departments with relevant responsibilities in, all, in order to promote that farm safe message and doing all that we can 
Um, I suppose, and particularly in terms of slurry, one of the issues that's, that's frequently raised is around the detectors and, and, and um, measuring the levels of gases. HSE still aren't in a position where they're content that that's the proposed way to go, but um, all those things are being considered and being taken forward as part of the action plan, which the Farm Safety Partnership have clearly set out. Call Mr. Edwin Pitts for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. What uh, steps is taken to ensure that people who are carrying out the inspections actually know what they're doing? Um, I've written to the Minister recently about a case uh, where the gentleman had soil stored, and uh, people have mistaken it for chicken manure. And actually, that soil has now been used uh, by another department in terms of actually used as soil for their particular facility. So, can we have people who actually know uh, what they're doing whenever they go out to carry out these inspections? Well, I'd like to think that all um, inspectors that go out are fully qualified, and I'm sure the previous minister will be fully aware of that when it comes to. Um, asking or dealing with individual cases. I don't wish to comment on the one case that he has written to me about, but happy to correspond with him in private in, in relation to that. But I can assure him that if there's particular issues with um, inspectors not carrying out their job properly, I'm always very happy to take a look at that. Well, Mr Ian Milne for a question. Yes, Dr. Rado. Question two, let the whole. In the annual progress report on the Rural White Paper Action Plan, I made a commitment to explore options for strengthening rural proofing. Having considered this issue, I believe that there is more that we can do to improve the effectiveness of rural proofing um, process across government. Therefore, I am proposing to introduce rural proofing legislation during the lifetime of this current Assembly, subject to executive agreement. This important bill will provide my department with a firm basis for promoting rural proofing across government and help to ensure that the rural needs are fully considered in policy making. Whilst all government departments have been committed to carrying out rural proofing since 2002, this new legislation will build upon this present commitment and help to improve the effectiveness of rural proofing across government. In particular, it will increase the availability and transparency of information on how rural proofing is carried out within government departments. Call Mr. Milne for supplementary. For my good, I'll ask on Kulger, August August on Ira G. Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Can the Minister provide an update on the Rural White Paper Action Plan? Um, yes, the first annual progress report on the Rural White Paper Action Plan was published earlier this year and demonstrates that good progress was made by departments in implementing their commitments in the Action Plan during its first year of operation. Further reports from departments during this year indicate that good progress continues to be made and I hope to be able to publish the second annual progress report later this year. I see the Rural White Paper Action Plan as a live initiative which continues to respond to the needs of rural dwellers, so I have therefore asked my executive colleagues to identify new and challenging actions for inclusion in a refreshed Rural White Paper Action Plan which I intend to publish in 2015. Well, Mr. Joe Byrne, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answers thus far and her commitment to rural proofing. But can the Minister state what concrete proposals has her department had in the last year to embed rural proofing? And what has been done across other departments at this juncture to make sure that rural proofing becomes a reality? Well, I, I suppose just to, to be clear, the reason that I'm, I'm proposing to bring forward legislation is because I, I, I'm not convinced that whilst I think that individually departments are all doing their best in terms of rural proofing, particularly when it comes to policy development, there's no clear tangible way to measure that. And I don't think that I think there's other opportunities that we need to be exploring. Because it's all well and good having the Rural White Paper Action Plan. However, we don't want that just to become a tick box exercise for departments. It, it very much needs to be a live document. So I think there's opportunities for us to really provide uh, a firm basis for rural proofing to make sure that it's consistent across departments, to make sure that some of the possible areas I think that we can look at is that there's an obligation on departments to maybe feed into DARD, particularly around the work that they do in relation to, to rural proofing, to make the, sure that there's consistency. So um, f for me, th 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 there's a lot of benefit in terms of bringing this forward. One of the key areas I think, um, w which I think w is going to be necessary is that um, quite a lot of consultation is necessary in terms of talking to the stakeholders around what they also identify needs, but also um, given the members' role in the, uh, the DARD our committee, that there will be a role for the committee in terms of scrutinising the legislation that we bring forward. Well, Mrs. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister uh, for, for that response so far. Will the Minister at least now give a commitment uh, to speak to her, her colleague, the Sinn Féin uh, Education Minister, in regards to uh, the possibility of the Department's real proofing of the decisions um, regarding the future of rural schools, just like Scotland does, before he shuts any more. 
Um, well, I can assure the member that I've had many conversations with the Minister of Education and he's very clearly put on record his commitment to maintaining um, rural schools and making sure that what he provides is first-class education for all children right across the board. He's made it very clear also that when it comes to the future of schools, it's not merely a numbers game. It comes down to the position of the school within the community. So there are um, six criteria that are clearly set out when it comes to the future of schools and I'm um, assured of his commitment to maintaining the best quality education for all children. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister what um, action she has taken to ensure not only rural proofing but uh, shared, for, shared future proofing for all of our policies and programmes? Well, I can give the member an assurance, particularly in terms of some of the projects that we've seen taken forward through the rural development programme. There's been quite, quite a lot of um, work that's been done particularly around in rural communities, around churches, working together and trying to um, reach out and, and bringing people together. So um, I think my commitment is on the record in terms of what we've actually done on the ground. I'm very happy to provide um, maybe a bit more detail on actual projects that we have taken forward that very clearly demonstrate a shared future. But I can assure you that at the core of everything that I do, there's an equality. Uh, equality is at the core of everything that I do, and, and, and that obviously is key to, uh, in terms of a shared future for everybody. Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Minister has said rural proofing is quite uh, very important. She's also said that she intends to bring forward legislation. Uh, can she then outline, given that she has been in office for some time, what the change has been in rural proofing under her watch compared to previously? Well, I can certainly give you, um, particularly over the last two terms, because before my time when Michelle Gildney was Minister, um, we made sure that rural proofing was to the core of this department. And we've seen significant progress right across all departments. However, as I've said, all departments have signed up to the white paper. That's something that's reviewed every year. But I think there's a lot more scope there for um, a lot more positive collaborative working across departments. I think my commitment has, um, is very evident, particularly when it comes to tackling poverty and social isolation. So at all the programmes across my department, the, the evidence is there to, to back up that I um, truly am a champion of rural communities. Call Ms. Karen McEvitt for a... Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question three. Proposals for fishing quotas are made by the European Commission and are based on scientific advice for fish stocks. At the Fisheries Council on the 15th to the 16th of December, ministers will discuss the Commission's proposals and reach agreement on fishing opportunities for 2015. It is expected that initial proposals will be published around the end of October or early November. As usual, my main priority will be prawn quota for Area 7, which includes the Irish Sea, and is the main quota fish by vessels and that are based here. The prawn stock is surveyed and assessed annually and the scientific advice on catch limits is published at the end of October. This ensures that all the latest survey information is included in the stock assessment. The Commission's proposals for prawn quotas will be based upon that advice. Another stock of importance of, of, to us is the IRC heron. The latest scientific advice shows that the stock is in good condition but a small reduction is recommended in order to remain within the maximum sustainable yield levels. It's expected that the quota will vary up and down annually around the 5,000 tonne level. The scientific advice for cod has not changed for several years and there, um, it is that, that there should be no uh, directed cod fishery and that bycatches are kept to a minimum. We're doing all that we can with highly selective fishing gears to keep cod bycatch below 1.5%. It's inevitable that some cod will be caught in the prawn fishery and the quota is probably as low now as it can be to accommodate this bycatch. So I'll be resisting further cuts, which, could be, um, which would be completely pointless, and do nothing for cod recovery. Ms McCavitt, for something. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what prior discussions have thus far taken place with Brussels uh, in order to get that better fish quota um, for, uh, deal for the people of Northern Ireland, and what impact she thinks that will have on our fishermen? Well, obviously, um, every December, fishermen watch with interest, and we enter into a period now where the Commission firstly publishes their advice on what they believe the quota should be. We then have to go to Europe and fight science with science, so we bring our own science um, expertise to that discussion. Uh, I go to Brussels with a, a, an agreed approach, which I'll talk to the industry about over the next number of months. We'll have a, we have a set out timetable, and we go and we fight the case for quota. I don't think the way Europe does it is the right way to do it. I don't think that fishermen can plan for the future based on a yearly quota. This needs to be something that's set out over a number of years so people can financially plan and take business decisions. However, that being said, we are where we are, and I'll go out and fight for the adequate quota and fight against cuts, which um, in all likelihood we'll see the Commission trying to put forward again. Well, Mr John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Grateful to the Minister for her replies. The Minister will know that licences have been issued lately for the Moore and Herring fishery. Um, 
She will also be aware that the EU embargo on Russia will affect the market, dramatically affect the market for that. Um, could you make some, has any analysis been done to provide any compensation to those license holders and what other effects uh, might it have on other sectors of the agri-food industry? Yes, um, obviously the Russian import ban has an impact. Um, even if you take the last year, we didn't actually sell any fish into Russia. However, there will be a knock-on effect in that as the market, the European market, um, has an abundance, that there will, there will be a knock-on effect for us, particularly in terms of price. So that's going to be an issue for, for the fish sector to deal with and, and something that we're, we're um, actively involved in conversations with. In European level, I was in Brussels about three weeks ago just to talk about both that issue and also the fact that there, there is an implication for the dairy sector, particularly the cheese sector. So um, we've made it very clear to the Commission that, that what we need to see is timely intervention, that we need to see support um, coming uh, at, at an appropriate time because of, uh, you'll be aware in the past that quite often the, the EU steps in when it's too far down the line and a lot of businesses have already been negatively Im impacted. So I can assure the member that um, that the, the Russian issue is something that's high on our, on our agenda and something that we're, we're looking at. And the other area actually in terms of supporting these industries is that we're actually looking for new markets. So that whether that be for the dairy sector or the fish sector, actively looking for new markets um, at an EU level and then also at a local level is also key. To Chris Hazard for question. Last can call you and thank the Minister for answer thus far. Can I ask the Minister to provide an update on the European Fisheries Fund for a moment? Yes, the, the, the fund will remain open up until the end of December 2014 and applications are still invited for projects that can, can um, complete by the end of 2015 when the programme will close. Up until the end of August of this year, the department has made a commitment of um, just over $7.5 million to the fish industry, which is um, obviously money that's jointly dared funding and European funding. Um, so the, the, spender, the spending, I think it's fair to say the spending under EFF has been less than, than what we would have wanted to see. But I think there's, there's been, a, a, I suppose, a number of factors that contributed to that, particularly around uncertain economic climate, which has sort of affected the, the, the confidence of the industry to invest. But um, also we had the, the decommission scheme actually that didn't go ahead, so that, that also had an impact on, on the spend. But looking to the future, we have the new EF. MF um, funding which will um, go into place. We have a task force in place and the aim of that is to try and get that spend onto the ground to make sure that um, as we design programmes the fishing industry are integral to, to, to all of that. So um, a lot of positive work is being going on and the task force is actually met now on a couple of occasions and is going to report by the end of the year. Bank Nesbitt for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Just returning to the original question about quotas in the December uh, Fisheries Council, what, what can the Minister uh, say that would give uh, confidence to the local fishing fleet that she's ahead of the curve in terms of preparation for that critical event? Well, I think the industry um, will make it, are very aware of my approach to this over the last number of years. We've won out. We've fought the very, um, a hard battle with the European Commission. We go out very clearly. There's no point in going out to Europe unless you have science to back up your argument. We have actually, a number of years ago, very clearly put forward a proposal around selective gear, which allowed us to be able to avoid cuts. So that my t um, so track record can speak for itself in terms of my commitment to standing up for the industry in Brussels, and I'll do that again this year. Call Mr. Samuel Gardner for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. The results of the June 2013 Agriculture and Horticulture Survey um, the latest available data show that land let under Conacher accounts for 31% of the total area of farmland. Gardner, for supplement. Uh, thank you to the Minister. But can the Minister tell us how many active farmers depend on the significant acreage of rented land for their farming operations? I don't have the number of active farmers that are actually on the, the, the acres, that have, the 31% um, percent that I've talked about, but I'm very happy to try and provide that to the member. However, you'll be aware that we're working with a new active farmer definition from um, the next year, so it, the, those t statistics mightn't be available. Um, suffice to say that um, obviously the active farmer issue is, is a contentious issue at the moment and making sure that everybody understands what it defines an active farmer. Um, we've been very anxious to make sure we get that very clear and out there for, for people to understand. Mr. Patsy McGlone for something. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. And it was exactly on that very point that I was going to ask the Minister <clears throat> what, what is being done by the Department at the moment in regard to the definition of active farming and its implications for land which is set or taken in Conacre? 
Yes, I mean, I do think this is, this is an issue, and I, I think the rule of thumb should be if you, if you don't know you're an active, active farmer, you most likely aren't. But that being said, that's, that, that's just something to, that, that I would use as a definition in my head. But I, I think I'll set out for you, I think, um, given the, the difficulties, I think it would be good to set out just exactly what it means and, 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 and what we're trying to do. One of the things that the Delegated Act, the Implementing Act for Cap Reform, contains a provision that in 2015, entitlements to be issued under the new support regime must be allocated to the person that is um, enjoying the decision-making power. The benefits and the financial risks in relation to the agricultural activity being carried out on the land for which an allocation is requested. My, my best advice to anybody if they're unclear is that they contact our, our direct offices, they contact the helpline uh, and seek out the information. The provision um, that we now have has particular relevance to, to, to us because we have the Conacher system and, and that's um, obviously a, a long-standing uh, system that we have. But in general terms, it means that in 2015, when all existing single farm payment entitlements um, are abolished, the new entitlements and new entitlements are established, then landowners that are renting out land in Conacher will not be able to establish entitlements on that land. And what we're going to do is we're reviewing the information that the department holds at this moment in time for all farm businesses which submitted an application for single farm payment this year. And we're going to write out to all those businesses with... Um, which we think the review suggests that they won't be an active farmer. So we're actively, proactively targeting those people. Um, we're going to be encouraging them not to be putting forward an application in 2015, if that's what we believe the case. And then I think that'll lead then to some farmers wanting to query that, which is, which is fair enough, and I think that's, that's the right um, direction that we should be taking. Um, we'll also be able to, next year, when people actually apply for single farm payments, we'll be able to also run reviews and, and check records to show if there is evidence of agricultural activity, so like looking at herd books, looking at movement histories, looking at all those things. So I think there'll be a number of ways that we can actually um, look at and establish if people are um, active farmers. So uh, whilst I accept that um, it's, a time of, it's a time of big change, but I, I, we're doing all we can to make sure we get the clar clarity out there as needed. Call Mr. Declan McAleer for supplementary. What advice would the Minister and, and her department have for potato and vegetable growers who have difficulty in accessing land? Margaret. Yes, well, I'm, I'm aware that um, of some reports that potato and vegetable growers are having difficulty obtaining land in 2015 as landowners are perhaps speculating and, tr and trying to um, hold on to their land to see if they can maximise their, the value of their entitlements for 2015. Again, the department has made available information to growers in a Q&A brief that's on the DARD website, and I encourage people to, uh, farmers to take a look at that and landowners. The Q&A points out the, um, the issues of whether landowners rent out their land or farm it themselves is obviously determined probably because of um, financial benefit for themselves and therefore depends on the Conacher rent that's on offer. It's important that the return um, received from establishment entitlements in 2015 is fully understood and compared with the alternative of foregoing Conacher rent in 2015. And there's actually a worked example of that on the Q&A and I advise people to, to take a look at it. Potato and vegetable growers will also have the option of establishing entitlements on the rented land in 2015 and transferring these back to the landowner provided the landowner is also a farmer after 2015. So I believe that it should be possible for landowners and potato vegetable growers to reach an agreement on the way forward, which would see the land being rented out for potato and vegetable production. Mr William Irwin for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. There's still a lot of confusion among farmers, and especially young farmers, in what constitutes head of holding. Has her department yet decided what constitutes head of holding? I assure the member that um, every piece of information that I have, young farmers have it. Our problem is that Europe are yet to define a few remaining um, issues, particularly around young farmer. So we have a meeting now actually on the 6th of October, the European um, Commission officials, and we're hoping that, hopeful that maybe there's clarity provided at that stage. We're asking for the clarity. I know other member states are asking for the clarity. So we're hoping, hopeful that with a bit of pressure, um, perhaps after that meeting on the 6th of October, we'll have a bit more information to provide to the young farmers. Mr. Basil McRae for a question. Question number five, please. I remain committed to um, supporting research and recognise that it's vital in supporting the agri-food sector's plans for outlined in the Going for Growth report. My department engages with stakeholders when prioritising its evidence and innovation needs, which helps to ensure that funding is correctly targeted. My department is well advanced in preparing the DARD-directed AFB research work programme for 2015-16. DARD funds an NI contact point based in the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, whose role is to facilitate the local agri-food industry research community in drawing down increased EU research funding. 
The Department is funding postgraduate studentships to help drive innovation in the industry and to foster future local world-class leaders in industry, research and teaching, whilst developing the science base here in the north. The industry-led Dard Research Challenge Fund encourages collaboration between rural enterprises and the research community, and five new projects have recently been commissioned. The Depart my department is working to develop strategic alliances and collaborations with other government funders to help coordinate research and evidence gathering for the agri-food sector. For the new rural development programme, DART has been developing proposals for innovation partnership groups which aim to bring together farmers, advisors, businesses and researchers to advance innovation on, uh, in the agricultural sector. Mr McRae for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Minister outlined uh, uh, one of the strategic aims of being to draw down further funds from Europe. Uh, can she tell me, uh, in light of the fact that the first tranche has been announced for science, has agriculture, either by AFBE or any other um, institution, been successful in applying for Horizon 2020 funding and actually achieved any uh, drawdown? As I said, um, one, one of the constraints, AFBE is obviously um, funded, 18% of my resource budget actually goes to AFBE, but outside of that we're very um, dependent on looking outside of, and particularly looking to Europe, and you'd be aware the executive has a Horizon 2020 target of drawing down um, increase of 20%. We have now appointed our, our person in AFBE who is going to actually be targeting that funding. We have no confirmation of new funding, but we are actively working um, out in Europe trying to form partnerships. And one of the key areas that we have developed under the new rural development programme is um, actually partnership working, and that is actually farmers, that is researchers, that is scientists, that is everybody coming together. And I think that there is going to be, well, we believe that there are certainly opportunities in Horizon 2020 for us to be able to take that forward, but not as yet. We do not have, have confirmation of, of funding. Mr. Sean Roy. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you, thank you for your answers thus far. Minister, given the cuts that AFBE is experiencing, like other organisations, what is the Department prioritising within their budget to ensure that we maximum delivery in terms of the, the econ economy of Northern Ireland? I'm assuming the member is referring to the AFBE budget. Um, particularly, I mean, obviously, public expenditure is under significant pressure for a combination of reasons. And AFBE, no different to any other element in my department, it as an arm's length body are, are being prudent and looking towards what potential savings they have. W one of the areas, as I said in the initial answer, is that um, it's not for us just to decide um, what areas need to be prioritised. We clearly have a vision for the agri-food sector, which is set out and going for growth. It clearly sets out where we need to be directing research and, uh, and support and innovation and technology transfer. For me, um, the priority to, uh, or how we establish our priority is in consultation with stakeholders, which is something that's an ongoing piece of work. We're actively working with AFBE now and stakeholders to design next year's programme and what research opportunities we're, we're exploring. Um, obviously, all sectors feel that they're, they're worthy of, of research pieces, but with limited budgets, you have to prioritise. Um, but as I said, we're actively working our way with AFBE officials to develop a strategic plan around research and what it is that they'll be targeting over the period from up to 2020. Call Ms. Bronwyn McGappin. Could the Minister tell us about the postgraduate research programme? The, the research programme was designed to ensure that we provide the best local students with the opportunity, um, provide, I suppose, the best opportunity for students to undertake uh, research that is directly relevant to our agri food industry. It has been successful in providing world class leaders in research, teaching, industry and policy development showing impact throughout the local agri-food sector. In, um, this year, DART increased the number of PhD studentships from 8 to 12, the majority of which are undertaken in conjunction with both Queen's University of Ulster and carried out at those campuses or one of the AFB or CAFRI sites. As part of our continuing need to provide assurance in relation to the value and quality of the PhD studentships, the Departmental Scientific Advisor has commissioned a review of the current arrangements. DART is funding postgraduate studentships um, to help drive innovation in the industry and to provide high-level training to help develop the science space in the north. PhD research areas are directly related to DART's priority in evidence and innovation needs. Mr Roy begs for a question. Question number seven. With your permission, uh, Lesh Tancourt, I'm going to answer seven and twelve together. My department received 3,495 applications to the Level 2 Agriculture Qualification. The qualification is one of the um, eligibility criteria required for the Young Farmer Scheme and the Young Farmer and the new entrant categories of the Regional Reserve. 
CAFRI is providing an accredited training course for those who do not already have the required Level 2 qualification. Equivalent or higher level agriculture qualifications are also acceptable, and CAFRI has compiled a list of eligible qualifications available on the website. DART has recently written to all those who applied for the Level 2 qualification in agriculture by the closing date of the 29th of August to provide further information on the Young Farmer Scheme and the Regional Reserve and to outline the possible types of evidence required to meet the Head of Olden eligibility criterion. Evidence will be required from young, farmers, young farmer applicants to demonstrate that they are ahead of Holton, and if they are unable to provide it, they will be unable to participate in the scheme or benefit from associated support until they satisfy the requirements. Officials are also seeking legislative advice on whether minimum age should be imposed for young farmers in order to satisfy the head of Holton requirement, and a decision that will be made in, the, in coming weeks. Officials are also currently seeking clarification in relation to the young farmer requirements, in particular in relation to the head of Holton requirement, and commercial Commission officials have been invited to Belfast on the 6th of October, and it's hoped that um, further cl clarification will be provided during that visit. Order. That ends the period for oral questions. There isn't time for supplementary. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Ms. Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. D uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister spoke earlier of the Farm uh, Safety Action Plan. I'd be curious to know uh, what steps the Minister has taken to include primary school children um, to instil that safety awareness at a young age. Um, yes, I, I don't have the detail with me, but certainly, yes, that's one of the elements that was looked at. And, and one of the other areas that the, um, the because a lot of schools actually do this work anyway, particularly schools in rural areas. But one of the, the areas that the um, Farm Safety Partnership looked at is, uh, was there some elements that they could incorporate even in the curriculum that would, um, that would help? So um, yes, particularly around imaging and, and uh, you know, diagrams that, are, that are children would sort of um, resonate with. So um, there's been some work done on that, but I'm ha very happy to provide to, the, to the, the member any other sort of detailed information or actually what we have done. Call Ms. Sugden for supplementary. Um, thank you for the answer. And um, would the minister consider engaging with community and voluntary groups such as young farmers to sort of engage with the, with the younger group of people in rural areas? I regularly engage with young farmers group, and um, I've met them over the last couple of months at different shows, and they do great work, I think, in terms of reaching out and getting that positive message. I'm very, very encouraged by the number of young people that have actually applied to be head of holding under the new CAP regime. I think to me that very clearly sets out a change in the age structure in the farming industry, which um, all, all those young people, particularly are, um, now who are wanting to, who either have qualifications in agriculture or who are now going to take part in the level two qualification, there will be a farm safety um, element to that training. And I think that's going to be key in terms of changing mindsets and making sure that people start out on their farming um, business w w with that sort of key to the, or to the forefront of their minds. Question two was withdrawn. Mr. Chris Hazard is not in his place. I call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister um, inform the House whether or not her department is still on target to um, achieve the 85 per cent target for single farm payments? Yes, we'll be, we'll be announcing our targets um, over the next few while. But yes, I mean, the member will be aware that year on year we've had increased um, numbers reached by December. My aim is this year to um, go even better than, than last year. Um, there's no doubt about it. It's been a challenging year. It is a challenging couple of years with cap reform. But yes, um, my intention is to um, I give an assurance to this House last year that I'll continue year on year to make improvements. Call Mr McCree for supplementary. Um, well, that's certainly uh, good news that that is to be the case, and we look forward to seeing the, the outworkings of that. In respect of the inspections that need to be carried out, um, is the Department um, on target in respect of that also? Yes. Again, um, in our endeavour to try and increase the, speed up the payments, we have switched obviously to a lot of remote control sensing inspections, and this year we were able to start those earlier again, which should obviously improve the, the bigger picture. I, don't have, I think it's 1,200 and just over 1,200 um, remote control sensing inspections this year, so um, we were certainly um, further on than we were this time last year. Mr Trevor Clark is not in his place. Mr Robin Newton is not in his place. I call Mr Joe Byrne, who is in his place. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister say at this stage if the EU infractions fine problem from Brussels relating to DARD has gone away, or what is the current situation regarding infraction fines? Well, the Member be aware that we are trying very hard to avoid infraction, that we have been working very hard with the remapping exercise to try and 
avoided. And we've had success in that year on year. We've had a reduced fine. However, we want to get to the stage where we rule it out altogether, or certainly um, tr try our best to rule it out altogether. Um, we'll be waiting, um, obviously, confirmation of, of this year's um, fine. But, but we're pretty confident that, um, same as last year, that, that re the, the fine is certainly is coming down. Call Mr. Joe Byrne for supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister state if there is a unit within the Department that is actively dealing with this issue to make sure that we do not incur any further fines given the tight budgetary situation? I can assure the member it is my aim to get the position where we avoid fines altogether. We have people working um, seriously hard around remapping. You will be aware that we had a remap over 750,000 fields, so it has been no mean feat. But my officials, along with um, Lippis, the, who are working on the Lippis project, along with DFP, land and property, property um, officials have been working hard to make sure that we do avoid future disallowance. Mr David McNary is not in his place. Mr Edwin Poots is not in his place. Ms Bronwyn McGahan, who is? Can I ask the Minister um, to tell us about our recent visits to the Ploughing Championships in County Leash? Yes, um, the Ploughing Tappers were fantastic. We actually had, um, I think those record numbers actually attended the Ploughing this year. Um, 1,400 our businesses across Ireland um, were exhibiting and over 100 were actually from the six counties. So I think that shows that um, being there, people actually do business, and I took the opportunity to, to visit as many of those um, stands as I, as I possibly could. And they were doing real business, and were very enthused by, by um, what, what they can get out of the show. We also took the opportunity in our Dard um, stand to offer the opportunity to new and smaller businesses that are trying to establish themselves, but perhaps can't afford to um, take a stand yet at such a significant. Um, uh, agricultural show, and I know from talking to those people that were on our stand, they could clearly see the benefits, and were so grateful for the opportunity to um, actually have an opportunity to, to, to be there and promote their, what, what they have to offer. So, for me, it was success all round. Um, congratulations to all our local ploughmen and, and ploughwomen, indeed, who, who um, were successful in, in taking part in the competition itself. But the show is certainly something for everybody, and I think that. Um, I know I certainly enjoyed the show, and, and it just really is. It's a, an absolute showcase of what we have to offer in Ireland. Ms. McGavin, for supplementary. Gurmi I, I thank the Minister for her response. Can I ask the Minister how practical would it be for the industry here in the North uh, to make a bid to host the event sometime in the near future? Well, I think it would be fantastic to have the National Ploughing Championship um, North. It's always sort of in, in a in the Midlands sort of area, given just the nature of the land. But I know just from having some sort of conversations at the show that others certainly would be keen to, to see that happen. I intend to actually write to Anna May, who, is the, who, who runs the whole show, the president of the show, and, and actually ask if that's something that they would seriously consider, because I think we would be absolutely honoured and, and privileged to host such significant agri-food rural um, event, which, which is just, it, it really does attract so many people, as I said, record numbers year on year. Over 120,000 people came to that, because you can imagine the knock-on impact that would have economically for local businesses and tourism uh, and everything that goes along with it. So uh, certainly I'd be keen for that to be the case, and, and, and I'll certainly ask if that, if that could happen in the future. Order. Time is up. That concludes question time.